Hey everyone! Uh, yeah, first off, giveaway going on. $99 Nintendo Switch eShop gift card description or pinned comment to enter. Uh, secondly, hey, welcome to Prime Answers, folks. Man, uh, this is a kind of a special uh, video. So I do Q and A's every live stream, but I know not people people can't always make every live stream. So in this video, I'm going to timestamp every question, uh, including obviously the headline question. I don't even know what it is yet, uh, but I'm basically. I take people's questions. If you are a Patreon member at patreoncom Prime, a YouTube member, or if you are a subscriber over on our Twitch channel, uh, I have a separate private channel on our Discord server where people submit questions. And then I also take a handful of questions off of Twitter. Uh, and I'm going to try to make this show a weekend show that happens every single week. I used to do this show way back in the day, uh, and I got rid of it. I'm going to try to show the questions on screen. We'll see how fancy the editing gets because I have so many videos in the works right now. You guys have no idea. So much for you to look forward to. Uh, but let's get into the first question. Uh, and the first one comes from KR Space T uh, over on our Discord server. It looks like he is a patron. And he says, how much on Switch do you think Immortals Rising has sold? The Immortals Phoenix Rising, the Ubisoft game. And how do you think it compares to other systems while Immortals is on the top 10 on PS4 and Xbox One? Is that because it sells better or because it is because less is selling on them in general? Uh, so this, this question was um, a little bit earlier this month. Um... Immortals Phoenix Rising, I think, sold incredibly well on Switch. I think it might even be the best-selling version of the game. It's just, there's a lot of big games that sell on Switch as evergreen titles. So you tend to see a lot of Nintendo games in the top 10 or top 20. Uh, but I think Immortals Phoenix Rising probably sold well. I'm not, I don't know if it cracked a million, but I'm going to say it sold north of 500,000 copies. I know I own a copy on Switch. Uh, as for it selling well on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, of course it did. Because it was a really good game that deserve to have an audience, and I think enough people were interested in it. After all, it has a very Breath of the Wild-like vibe to it with comedy. Uh, and let me tell you, it's really, really damn good. It might be the best Ubisoft game in a hell of a long time, and that's saying something because Ubisoft makes a pretty decent amount of high-quality games. Next question comes from a longtime supporter, Corey Bohm. He's been a patron, he's been a member, he's been a donator on streams. Uh, he goes, Sonic Prime question, which Nintendo IP do you think will be loaned to Sega next? It might be the pending Microsoft sale. Cool that. So he's basically saying, hey, look, Microsoft could potentially be buying Sega, which is potentially possible. There's a lot of things happening with Sega Sammy right now. Uh, and he talks about what IP do you, I think Nintendo could loan to Sega and if it will be affected. I don't think they're going to loan anything other than Mario for Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games. I don't see Nintendo loaning them anything else moving forward, um, especially while the company's in flux. I think Nintendo's going to keep things a little close to the vest when it comes to Sega and just leave it at that. So we'll see. This next question comes from patron Sonic Man the Best and he says, Prime question. Do you think PlayStation would benefit by abolishing its Sony Corporation ownership status and act as an American company? So what he's talking about is essentially most of Sony's video game um, decisions are now being made in their new headquarters here in America. Uh, while Sony is a corporation still has an overall presiding factor in Japan and is still the heart and home of Sony and its CEO, uh, most of the video game stuff is being handled by the American wing of uh, Sony Interactive. So it's really interesting to see the dynamic as Sony has lost almost all of their ground in Japan after PlayStation 4, which by the way, PlayStation 4 was no slouch in Japan. 9 million, almost 10 million in sales as a home console in a, in a country that is really into handheld gaming. That is actually really, really good. Uh, so Sony had an audience. And while PlayStation 5 is selling out in Japan, they're definitely not shipping that many units to Japan relative to other parts of the country. And all of their advertising for PlayStation 5 and PlayStation 5 games are geared to the West. The commercials that air in Japan Japan have American actors in them. They're not even targeting local Japanese audiences with their games. So I think it's very clear that everything's being ran now through what they consider to be their main market in North America. Uh, so do I think there'll be a benefit to it? I don't know that anything benefits by abolishing um, the Sony corporate in Japan oversight uh, because that essentially would mean splitting Sony into two different companies. I don't think that really benefits anybody. 
Uh, and I, if anything, I think it hurts Sony's reputation in Japan even more than it already is damaged. Uh, I think you need to keep everything under that corporate umbrella. Same reason, like, if Nintendo of America started making a majority of the de of the decisions, um, I don't think that Nintendo of Japan should just, like, become a separate company, basically. Sort of like Sega Sammy, but those were two separate companies, so, um, at one point. So, I, I'm just gonna say that I don't think there's really a, a, a reason to have to do it. I think what Sony is currently doing is working in general as playstation 5 is like one of the fastest launching systems for them ever so clearly whatever they're doing while it might be hurting one market it's leading to more success in others so i think you just let them be and plus they all have a lot of partnerships like you think that deal for final fantasy 15 and final fantasy 7 happens if sony corporate in japan isn't presiding over everything i'm not so sure so i think there's still a lot of benefits to keeping uh, Sony corporate overseeing the American headquarters for their gaming section. Now, over on Twitter, we have a question from Joshua Smith, and he says, will we see a Metroid Prime game on Switch this year or next year? So this year is the 35th anniversary of Metroid, and we haven't seen Metroid Prime 4 ever, not since they showed us the logo back in 2017, and then they announced in 2019 it was being rebooted by Retro Studios, and that's all we've heard. Everything else, while well, Bandai Namco and other companies that might have been working on the first version of Metroid Prime 4, technically all rumors and speculation that's unverified so right now i think we might see metroid prime 4 teaser by the end of this year i think 2022 is the earliest we could possibly get metroid prime 4 given the reboot status in 2019 so i'm gonna say there is a chance we get it in 2022 no chance we get it this year slight chance because it's metroid's 35th anniversary that they might actually show us part of the game but 2022 target date 2023 likely date if it's delayed which it probably will be if it was announced for 2022 uh logan leblanc one of the regulars over on uh twitter he's always liking and retweeting stuff uh he asks what is your favorite switch game well breath of the wild is like my favorite game period but I also technically consider it a Wii U game ported to Switch, even though it launched on both at the same time. I know the development history, it was a Wii U game. So I usually default to things like Mario Odyssey. Uh, Mario plus Rabbit Kingdom Battle is way up there. So is uh, Phoenix Rising is way up there as well now. Uh, I have a lot of Switch games I play a ton of. I played a ton of Splatoon 2. Uh, Splatoon 3 is going to shoot up that list in a hurry. But for now, I'm going to go with Mario Odyssey because I really love Mario, and that is an amazing game that every Switch owner should experience. Uh, this next question comes from Game Stoic Now has a PS5, aka at Nintendo Dave One. Uh, he says, "Now that you secured yourself a PlayStation 5, thank you, I did. Uh, what is an upcoming exclusive game that you're looking forward to? Mine is Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. Uh, that Kenna game, is that what it's called? Kenna? That game comes out in like a month or something, right? Like Ratchet and Clank uh, Rift Apart. I, I didn't even realize it doesn't come out till June." Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that game, but that, dude, that Kenna game, man, it looks so good. I mean, look at this trailer. It looks so beautiful. Like that was the one thing from the state of play they recently did that really excited me. It was like, Hey, I know we already know about this game, but God damn, does it look good every time we see it? Like it's got that Nintendo magic to it, but like the Sony flair, I, I dude, I'm, I'm so excited, uh, to play that game. So that's actually like one of the, my most hyped games of this year currently. Our last question comes from my friend and fellow YouTuber, Game Over Jesse, over on Twitter. He says, not based on rumors, what are your actual thoughts on how powerful the Switch Pro will be and when will, when will it release? So he's basically saying, set aside every rumor that exists, every report that exists. Just tell me straight up, what do you think this thing's going to be setting aside what everyone else has said? How do I set aside everything I've ever reported on for three years and can come up with it? Like, I'm too tainted. Let's just be honest. I'm too tainted. So let me set a realistic expectation bar. I don't know if it's going to have 4K through DLSS. I know a lot of people are saying that. I don't know if it's going to have a new screen, even though they have a, a factual partnership with InnoLED display. So here's my deal. I think we're going to get a 1080p screen. I think it's bare minimum going to be more powerful in that it'll be a Tegra X1 running at clock speeds or overclocked on a smaller die shrink. This is bare minimum what I expect. Uh, and it'll add an extra couple gigs of RAM, bare minimum, and we'll see a boost in 32 gigabytes of internal storage to 64 gigabytes of internal storage, and that's it. I don't think they're going to improve the Joy-Cons or anything, even though I want them to. That's what I'm setting my bar at for my personal expectations. That's not what I want them to do. 
I want a lot of these rumors to actually be more true, but I'm setting my bar as that's kind of new 3DS territory. But if they go beyond, I am more than happy with that. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode, this reboot of Prime Answers episode one here in 2021. Just like the Nintendo Prime podcast, I'm, I'm trying to bring everything back bigger and better than last time. Uh, so you guys let me know ways I could improve this. Otherwise, if you have questions, be sure to follow over on Twitter or become a member uh, and subscribe and all that jazz um, so you can go to our Discord server uh, and, you know, get your questions in as a patron if you decide to become a patron at patreon.com slash Nintendo Prime and for as little as $1. Get your questions in every week. I will always answer every patron's question each week. Um, don't really have a theme. It's just always gaming questions, so keep them coming.